Today on Applied Science, I'm going to show you how to print some cool stuff with this new Formlabs printer, including a copy of your own brain using some open source software that I found. So let's start off by taking a look at a time lapse of how this printer works. This time lapse shows about an eight hour print, and you can see how the machine works. It maintains a puddle of photosensitive resin and then uses a laser to cure little bits of that resin into solid material and pulls the part out of the bath of resin. Now, of course, it doesn't happen all at once like is shown in the time lapse. In slightly faster, or slightly closer to real time, you can see what the machine actually does. It actually picks the part up out of the resin for each layer and then puts it back in and makes the next layer. So because of this, it's actually very easy to make a synchronized time lapse. Let me show you how I did it. When the printer is running, um, the lid should be closed, but I'm going to open it up just so you can see this. When the printer is running, this tray moves back and forth as part of the normal print process. And conveniently, that means that we can put a little micro switch here, and every time the tray comes over to finish a layer, it bumps the micro switch. And I bought a, a really cheap uh, remote shutter release for my camera from Amazon, and then just um, hardwired the micro switch up to the switch contact. So it's basically like every time the micro switch closes, it's just as if you were holding your button, your finger down on the shutter release button. And um, the reason this works out well is because the camera has a bulb shutter release setting. So every time the tray is over here, the machine is printing. And then um, when that layer is done, the tray moves away and comes back. So it's like you're releasing your finger from the button and then putting it back down. So the shutter is open the whole time that it's printing. Conveniently, this camera is a Panasonic G85 and it will make a time lapse automatically in the camera. So all I have to do is set up the photo settings, like the size and how many frames per second I want. And then I actually get an MP4 file right out of the camera. The wide range of parts that can be made on this machine, and especially the detail level of those parts, is really impressive. Uh, let me show you what I mean. So at work uh, for rapid prototyping, we have to have lots of small detailed parts made on a regular basis. And until recently, we've used an external service to have these parts made on industrial SLA machines. It probably cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, so can you tell which is which in this photo? One of these came from the industrial half million dollar machine or whatever, and the other one came from the form too. And uh, we've done careful measurement and everything, and the parts from the Form 2 are as good or even better than the very expensive external service parts. Let me give you another example. Uh, another thing that we have to do at work is make little microfluidic devices. And what's cool is we can print the passageways into the part directly with the 3D printer. So I didn't drill these holes. These were printed in the part by the 3D printer, of course. And uh, it comes off the machine with sort of a frosted finish. And all I did was lightly sand it on a piece of glass with 600 grit, uh, then 1,000 grit, and finished it up with a, a flap wheel with some white rouge. And it makes an optically clear component with five or 600 micron holes in it. So if you keep the hole in plane, like if you don't change direction, you can print down to about 500 micron passageways. Um, and if you do change direction, this one has like a, um, a 90 degree bend printed into it. The smallest uh, channel size can get down to about six or 700 micron, maybe 800. Uh, in any case, pretty remarkable. You can also have um, corkscrews. I mean, <laughs> the things that you can print are very, very unlike the things that you could machine or cast in any other way, right? So this kind of opens the door for doing all sorts of unusual microfluidic type things pretty unreal that this is 3D printed. I mean, if someone showed this to me 10 years ago and said this is a 3D printed part that came from a desktop machine, I definitely would not have believed it. If you're into 3D printing, you've probably downloaded things from Thingiverse before, but there's actually another source of parts that's really useful, and that's McMaster Car. So you've probably noticed that they have 3D models for a lot of the parts on their site. And a really convenient thing to do, especially for pipe fittings, I've found this is actually really great for pipe fittings, download the step file, uh, import it into Fusion 360, and then save the STL. And Fusion 360 will even import the, like it sends the STL directly to the Formlabs printer software automatically. So the whole process takes about two minutes. It's download, convert, right into the printer software. And then you can print it out. 
and the resolution is good enough where you can print uh, quarter inch pipe threads like this that thread together just fine. And if you put pipe sealant on here and really clamp this thing down, you actually have a workable pipe fitting. Um, Form Labs has about 10 or 20 different materials that you can print with in this printer. And one of the materials is like a polypropylene simulant. So it's, it has much higher fracture toughness than um, typical clear resins. And um, quarter inch pipe threads can be printed and used directly. And I actually have one of these in my sprinkler system right now, holding back, you know, 50 PSI water pressure or whatever. So it's actually surprisingly functional. I really didn't think the state of the art was this far along. Now it does have its limits, of course. You can't print um, an eighth inch pipe thread is really pushing it. If you put enough pipe sealant on here and your pressures aren't very high, it will hold together. But that's pretty much getting up near the limit. Nonetheless, it, it does give you the possibility whereas if you need some kind of a weird fitting that has you know, a quarter inch pipe on this side, three eighth pipe on this side, and a hose barb over here, you can just download all those parts from McMaster and merge them together in Fusion 360 and then print the whole mess out. I really like the ability to print in sort of negative space. So for example, this is a Tesla one-way valve. I don't know if you've seen these before. I downloaded this one off of GrabCAD. And the idea is that if you're flowing a fluid this way, um, the flow keeps getting redirected into these side channels and blown back at itself. So it's, it's supposed to act like a one-way valve. Well, this one doesn't work super well. Um, anyway, you get a, a, a large flow resistance in this direction and almost no flow resistance or, or much less flow resistance in this direction. And again, I took all the parts um, from Gab or GrabCAD and just summed them together in Fusion 360 and printed the whole mess out in one go and then just quickly polished the surfaces up. Really a cool technique. Um, I also like printing in negative space for sculpture stuff. So this is like a model of a few windmills outside my office building. And there's really no way you could get this since it's completely encased within solid material. I really like this technique. Let's talk about the brain for a sec. So of course, if you want to print out a model of your own brain, you'll need some imaging data and pretty much MRI is the way to go. Uh, I used to work in the brain imaging research field. So I happen to have quite a few scans of my brain laying around. And the starting resolution is about 256 square by 124. Uh, it's kind of a standard anatomical scan, as they call it, of your brain. And um, I searched around on the net and found a really clear set of instructions for how to use existing software to make this work. And so I'll put this all in the link description, or in the video description, of course. Let's talk about the mechanics of how this thing actually prints. So you do need support structures if you want to print an object that has these huge overhangs. So even though the uh, printer is going to pull this thing out of a bath of resin, um, you still need to support uh, a thing like this because it has such a high overhang. Like the material itself just can't suddenly appear out here. Uh, it needs to be supported. And so the software automatically adds all the supports you'll need. And um, that's fine. And they typically just break away. It leaves these little, um, little blemish marks here that aren't too big of a deal. However, if you you get more confident with how the system works, you can print directly on the platter of the machine and not use supports. So this object didn't really need supports. I printed this so that this was flat on the uh, base of the machine and it pulled it out of the resin tank and there isn't a single support on here. So it, thankfully the software allows you to do things that are not recommended and you can kind of decide for yourself what the sort of risk return ratio is. However, there's another interesting gotcha you'll see that there's a little hole here, and I put this here intentionally. I actually cut the STL file and made a hole here. And the reason is that if this is being printed in this orientation, this whole area or this volume in here is airlocked. And the way that the printer works is it pulls this thing in and out of a bath of resin. And every time it comes back down into the resin, there'll be air pressure trapped in here that's trying to like blow the resin out of the bottom. And this can create some print quality problems. So if you want to print any sort of a structure that has a sealed cup shape, you have to either vent it or orient the cup in a way that uh, the air can get out. There's also the ability to mix up custom colored resins. 
And so the uh, Form Lab supplies a kit with CMYK, and you can add the pigment to the resin to produce anything you want. And so I thought it might be fun to do sort of like a wood marquetry type thing with inlay. So I printed out the orange resin part and then printed out these white parts and just pressed them together. And I, it's just zero clearance and I just shoved the parts together. And it's, it's actually pretty darn close on the first try. You can see a couple of small problems here and there, but overall really nice. In any case, after the printer is done, the item is covered in uncured resin, right? Because it's pulling it out of this puddle of stuff, so it's completely coated in uncured resin. Uh, luckily, getting it off is pretty easy. You can just dunk the part in isopropyl alcohol. And Form Labs even makes a specialized washer that you can put your parts into, and it swirls the isopropanol around. Uh, and then after that, for, for some resins, like this clear resin, you, you can be done. Like, that's it. As soon as it's air dry, the part's fine. You can touch it. It has a nice surface quality. Uh, but you can also post-cure these by putting them into a high-temperature environment with 405 nanometer light. And that will harden the resin and give it slightly better mechanical properties. And uh, Form Labs even makes a specialized little oven with 405 nanometer LEDs in there. Looks pretty cool because the items uh, fluoresce. This is kind of an interesting point, right? Like if you're, if you were designing a 3D printer system like this and you were shooting your laser light in here, you don't want the laser light to go like all the way through the material. Even though this looks clear, it's actually not clear to the type of light that causes it to transform from a liquid to a solid. Um, if you were gonna make a coil like this, it wouldn't work because your laser beam would basically go all the way through the part and then cure all the coils. You know, it'd basically make a solid line. So these, uh, this resin is designed to stop 405 nanometer light and fluoresce at, you know, probably 450 nanometer or something. It's like kind of like a light blue color. So when it's in the curing tank, you can see it's fluorescing as, a, as basically being opaque to its cure wavelength. Kind of a cool quirk. Next, I downloaded this Vortex tube from GrabCAD and printed it at half scale. Uh, it doesn't work that well, but you can kind of see it on the thermal cam here to get an idea. I mean, at least it's doing something. If you haven't seen these before, it's this really cool thing, totally passive device, no moving parts, and you blow compressed air into here, and it gets hot on one end and cold on the other. It seems like it's doing something that shouldn't be allowed by physics, but if you think about it, it's actually making use of the kinetic energy. So it basically spins the air up to a high speed. And then when it slows that air down on the hot end, all that kinetic energy goes into heating the gas up. And then it allows the stream to keep moving the other direction where it cools down because it's being decompressed, right? Like it's fast moving and then it's compressed. And then as it's decompressing, it cools down again. So you're basically using some of the kinetic energy that's in the airstream to do this uh, heat movement. Um, like I say, it does work, but it, it could use some tuning there. I was kind of thinking one of the cool things we can do since um, the printer is so good at printing like tiny passageways is to make the smallest possible vortex tube, right? Something that you could power off of um, compressed air in a can, one of those canned air dusters. So I think that's going to be in the works pretty soon. Oh, I should mention that the reason that this resin is sort of orange tinted is because it's a special high temperature resin. Uh, Form Labs says this is good for like two or three hundred degrees C. And I was hoping that this Vortex tube would get hot enough to kind of, you know, push the limits at least a little bit. But uh, alas, not quite. So we'll see if I can uh, improve the design. Um, to show off how temperature resistant this material is, they even have a picture of a blowtorch nozzle made of this material, 3D printed. That is pretty cool. I printed this turbine fan in a uh, material that Form Labs calls rigid. It has their highest modulus and also their uh, lowest fracture toughness, but it's, it's still reasonable. You can actually still push the blades a little bit. It doesn't crack apart. Um, but they have a new material coming out that's just now released, a true ceramic material. Um, you can print a green ceramic right out of the printer and then fire it in a kiln and get a true ceramic part for really high temperature applications. And what I want to do is mix that ceramic resin with some other unusual ceramic type things, like for example, YBCO superconductor, and then fire it in a kiln, fuse it and anneal it. And then I could have like a 3D printed superconducting structure. And that actually sounds pretty uh, revolutionary to me. So that'll be coming up at some point in the future, uh, along with some other unusual applications for 3D printing. I'm kind of late to this whole 3D printing game, but I admit that it's pretty cool now, especially with a printer like this. 
Okay, see you next time. Bye.